rugged shores and woodlands of the north, it's history of copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fishery. To the farmlands of the southern counties, we'll look around, my friend, and all that waste the sportsmen in the state of Michigan. And sometimes when the moon brings out the diamonds in the snow, and the stillness of the forest lies encased in Arctic cold, the wind might whisper through the trees, listen if you can, it tells you of the beauty in the state of Michigan. Hi there, come on in. Some good news recently in the newspapers for those of us who believe that utilizing animals for food and for their hides and furs is natural and justified. Fur prices are going up for the first time in years. But this past weekend, some bad news on the front page. Animal rights fanatics firebombed the Mink Research Station at Michigan State University. Terrorism, plain and simple. We're going to review an MSU veterinarian's point of view on trapping, very pertinent given the reactions of these animal rights terrorists. This and more coming up, so you stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. His name is Jim Sikarski. Dr. Jim Sikarski. He's a wildlife rehabilitator with the College of Veterinary Medicine at Michigan State University. He and his students rehabilitate over 600 animals a year, some 120 or so are birds of prey, and in most cases, they're returned to the wild. But what does returning to the wild mean? In view of the recent controversy over trapping, I asked Dr. Sikarski to give me his point of view. His comments don't represent the College of Veterinary Medicine or Michigan State University. They're his own but they're based on a lifetime of working with animals. If we didn't remove those animals uh, uh, and disease or parasites are what kill them, they're, they're suffering with that too. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's plus the potential. I think that's one that, one, you know, this is an, an issue that I struggle with, uh, you know, being a rehabilitator, taking care of wildlife and all. Um, it would be easy to say we shouldn't trap at all, um, but I recognize, you know, I have a, a degree in population dynamics and wildlife ecology, uh, fisheries and wildlife, uh, and, you know, I think that there's got to be management. At, at this point, you know, we've, we've assumed or it's been thrust upon us the responsibility of managing wild populations. Hunting and trapping are management tools, there's no question about it. If we did not remove the surplus animals, they're going to uh, breed uh, and exceed the carrying capacity of their habitat and then die from starvation or disease or parasites which is inhumane or certainly some of those diseases and parasites can kill people or affect the livestock that we raise for our own use. Well, what, what happens to all of the muskrats and rabbits and foxes? I mean they have relatively short lifespans. Hunters and trappers only take a smidgen. Well, what think, happens to the rest? Well a lot of them die during the winter because of uh, the, the, the stress, the cold, the lack of food. Do, do that, they die happily, peacefully? Oh, see, uh, I, that's about as controversial as how much pain does sitting in a trap cause. I don't know how happy they are when they're starving. They can't be. Um, I mean, are, are their deaths often violent deaths or? Sure. I mean, if they're preyed upon by other predators, if they, if they just don't have enough to eat or if they're sick because of a heavy burden of parasites, they crawl off under a brush pile and die and nobody knows they were even there. Um, that's why I think most of the hunting and trapping is done in the fall. There's been studies that show that the, the majority of those animals that are removed by trappers would have died during the winter, would have starved in or died from disease. Uh, Mother Nature has to keep the population down. And if we, if we trap that surplus, um, then we remove the, that overpopulation and we use it as a resource, as a renewable resource, but we also then are, in some ways, keeping those populations healthy and stable within the carrying capacity of the habitat rather than these big peaks and troughs mm -hmm. of animals where at the peak the the disease, the loss, lack of food and that kills off the animal. Um, and, and also we've selected against a lot of the natural predators that used to help modulate the peaks and troughs of mm -hmm. those population fluxes. And, and I think the responsibility for management now is, uh, is with the wildlife manager. This is one that is a basic question that is coming up more and more and more. 
The animal rights organization calls themselves animal rights. And I see more and more it being questioned, what rights do animals have? When we talk about rights, that's a human thing. You have a right to free speech. You have a right to, you know, yeah. certain things. And there's responsibilities that go with rights. Now, what well, about... As, as a, I, I like to think of it as animal welfare, that, that especially as a veterinarian, I want to minimize suffering. I, I, I wouldn't trap now. Um, I'd have a hard time with that. Um, but I'd, if I did, I'd want to make sure that I did it in the best way possible. The, the animal welfare movement is, it has been very good, I think. Mm -hmm. the, the proper housing and care of animals to minimize suffering and, uh, and uh, you know, get the most good with the least harm. Well, I think we all agree with that. Yes. The, the neutering of animals, the making sure they're fed and bringing actions against people to treat their pets inhumanely. I can't imagine a person uh, in this world who would be against that. Mm -hmm. But moving this up to the level of rights, that the animals have the same rights as people do. That's an argument that, uh, y you know, is so fraught with emotion and um, some of the animal rights organizations uh, spend a great deal of time writing and uh, portraying images that tear at people's heartstrings to, to play on that emotions. And mm -hmm. that, that, that's why it's such a controversial issue. It's, uh, it's one that, um, I don't know, people have to make up their own uh, mind on and uh, hopefully on biological information, good sound information on you know, that's part of the reason why I agreed to come here and talk to you, is that hopefully the information that uh, um, is received from this kind of a discussion will help people put those issues, hunting and trapping and their importance as, as management, into perspective. And if they need to be done, then they need to be done well. Uh, if we're going to have to use trapping as a management tool, and I don't see a good alternative for some of these species, like the price of pelts is so low for beaver that uh, people aren't trapping them because it's, it's a big job to go out and run that big of a trap line. I was talking to a friend in Twin Cities, Minnesota. Their beaver are moved into the city. They're damming up culverts and flooding mm -hmm. subdivisions even. It's, uh, you know, it, it, you can laugh about it, but they also have Giardia and Tularemia and that uh, um, bacteria or protozoan in somebody's backyard where their children play can have pretty serious implications. And the need to manage those populations is, is obvious. And, and somebody has to have that responsibility. And, and people can be really upset that trapping and uh, things like that are used to manage those populations. But, boy, it, it needs to be done. The virtues of starvation over trapping or diseases over hunting may be argued. But if healthy, stable wildlife populations are the goal and threats to human health are to be minimized, management, some form of wildlife management, is unavoidable. And to date, nobody has come up with a practical alternative to hunting or trapping. Nobody disagrees with animal welfare, the humane treatment of animals. All of us are for that. But I like to think that all of us are against this animal rights fanaticism and terrorism that seems to be going around nowadays. That's why I've, I've invited Putting People First, a pro-human organization, to come and put on some important meetings at our outdoor fair. And speaking of spectacular deer, this weekend we'll unveil these unusual triplet fawns mounted by Franklin Soltz of Houghton Lake. These fawns were unborn, their mother was killed by a car, an unusual diorama will have on display through the end of March only at our new Michigan Outdoors TV Museum. Taxidermist Tim Hayes will be working at the museum on Saturday, and white-tailed deer artist Chuck Denault, who has provided a number of striking covers for the Outdoor Digest in the past two years, will be there as the featured wildlife artist all weekend. Great smallmouth and largemouth bass. In our Outdoor Digest, we have a map which shows the counties where most of the trophy smallmouth are caught in Michigan. It's those northern counties that border the Great Lakes. Now, since 1984, Antrim County has produced the most 20-inch-plus smallmouth, a total of 55. Grand Traverse was second with 25, followed by Mackinac with 17. And in double digits were Delta, Sheboygan, Leelanau, Benzie, and Iosco. Other counties produce trophy smallmouth, too, including Houghton County up in the UP. That's where we're going to start our trophy book. 
From Torch Lake in Houghton County came this 20-inch smallmouth on the 9th of October. George Shaw from Warren caught it on a jig and pig. On January 1st, Brian Armstrong from Saginaw took this 33 and a half inch walleye from the Saginaw River, caught it on a Rapala. It weighed just over 13 pounds. Here's a 30 inch walleye from the Saginaw River. Red McRae from Bay City caught it on a jig and minnow in early March. The middle of March, Ron Mazigian from Benton Harbor was using spawn, probably off the Benton Harbor Pier, to catch this 31 inch, 16 and a half pound Great Lakes brown trout. A week later, Bill Soraki from Traverse City caught this 35-inch brown trout, nearly 20 pounds, casting a Clio in West Grand Traverse Bay. On the last day in March, Greg Hardenberg from Whitehall landed this 37-inch steelhead from the White River in Muskegon County. He was fishing spawn, and you don't have to be big or experienced to catch a trophy largemouth bass. Six-year-old Daniel Kelsey from Novi caught this 21-and-a-half-incher from Kent Lake last summer. Casting a jig and worm, he wasn't sure what he had. Well, I thought at first I had um seaweed, but then I felt the fish. Yes, and then what happened? Then I pulled in. <laughs> Were you pretty happy with it? Yes. What'd you do with it? We released it. Did you? So it can get bigger and you can catch it again. It looks like in that picture, that you, that you were having trouble holding it up? Yes. How much did it weigh? We don't know. Like five. Four or five pounds, something like that, but it was 21 and a half inches long. Yep. Great story. And not just a great story, but a great gesture to release that prime spawning sized bass. Let's make six-year-old Danny Kelsey our Michigan Outdoors Trophy Bass Angler of the Week. Oh, okay, he just... Snapping turtles are dangerous. Nobody argues that. But Scott Ponce from Leroy catches them with his hands underwater by grabbing their tails. He wanted to teach me how to do it. Okay, now these, these paths through here, are these turtle paths or...? The wider ones going up through are turtle paths, um, but there's also uh, the ducks go up through there. Uh, they, come up through off, they come off the river and up and through here and go back through and then back on the river again. And... Uh, of course, that's and, where the turtles wait to and, ambush the ducks. Yep, they're ambushing them, yeah. The only bad thing about this pothole, right in here, if they're in here, it's too deep and sinky, and right here, we've got, we've got to get them on this edge and up through here because this is too deep. A lot of times they'll head to here. We've got to get them before they get here. We've got no. a little channel coming right through, and we've got to cut them off before they get here. Now, so we're not going to go in this way? No, we're going to go around over here, and we'll get a better look at it. We'll try to get him up, and we'll get a better... We'll get closer to him is what we'll do. So you figure that turtle is staying there? Yeah, he ain't going nowhere. He's up again. There he is. He moved too. He's up again. He's right. just to the right of that stick. The tip of that stick. Uh -huh. Just go to the right and you see a little open channel like where the ducks yeah. go through. Yeah. And you can just see his nose. <laughs> we'll get closer. Yeah. We'll get closer. They're hard to see. You got to know. A lot of times I use binoculars. Watch for the tips of their noses to poke above the water. Or you can attract their attention like Scott does, imitating an animal struggling in the water. They must think it's a duck, the only I can think of. You know, they think it's a meal, and they're trying to see where it is so they can either wait or... Sometimes, I've seen them come right at, you know, come toward the noise, too, in more open water. Well, you want to give it a shot? There's a there. snap. There's a big one. Big one, yeah. Turn right around. You'd see this one. He's a pretty good... He's got a pretty... See, he's moving his head. You see it move right there. He moved to the right. That's a pretty good turtle. Oh, uh, there I saw yeah, some of the water, water move, yeah. The water just come off his neck, yeah. That's a, that's a pretty good snapper right there. So we're going to be real touchy trying to get him. Now, he pulled his head down fast, he did. didn't he? Yeah, yeah. Usually they don't, but there ain't no pain got a head that big. <laughs> mm -hmm. He's a big one. They usually, they generally get on slower. And now how deep of water is he in, do you think? See the bubbles, see the bubbles. He's, he's, oh, yeah. he's moving, the bubbles are coming up. You see the bubbles coming up. He's moving toward the right. If he goes to the right, that's better because it's deep. Uh, he's in, we'll get wet, I'll get wet getting him. You got waders on, but we can go in and try him. See, he's moving to the right. You see all the bubbles going. Mm -hmm. He's just, that's better. Let him go to the right because it's, it's shallower. This turtle might be too deep, so we slip into a shallow area where we saw another snapper's nose a few minutes ago. Scott probes with a stick, trying to find the thunk of a turtle shell in the mud. Now I provide the invaluable service of remaining calm and watching for bubbles that would let us know if the turtle is trying to scurry away. 
And if the goal is just, just stand still. I'm starting to get nervous now. <laughs> I really am feeling these sticks in here. This is not as... The best thing to do is let him, if he does go, is just let him go. And just hopefully he goes that way. Is that it? Okay. Is that it? He's going. Here okay. Goes. Yep. Sit still. Whoa. Sit still. He's right here. He's, got, he's right, by, right between my legs. Right up in there. Something. Let's see. Let's you move. Something hit me. No, right I didn't. Leg. I didn't move. He's right here. And I'm not about to move. Did you see him go? Yeah, I saw him. We gotta find him. Here, right back here. Right back here. Uh -huh. Oh, there. Yep. Missing it, huh? Yes. He's keeping ahead He's of you. He's going deep water. I got it up here. It's too deep. He may have. He stopped. He stopped right here. He may have come up in here. I saw some bubbles okay. up in here. Okay. See, I, when I, I got it, that's why I tried to get ahead of him. It's too deep right See, that's why I said he tried to go to deep water. He's down by the log right here. Come on. Now, he might be in a snapping mode now, huh? Yeah, he'd be mad. Just be. There are bubbles all around here where, I guess just from where we've walked, but we think the turtle is right up in here. Oh, 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 I don't know, something's moving. Just hold still. I am going to hold still. Can you feel it now? Am I doing that? Is that you? Yeah, I'm moving around <coughs> right here. Oh. <laughs> okay. okay. I feel better now. Okay. okay. He moved the log, it scared me. Okay. Are you still moving it? Oh, it's under here! Okay. Jeez! Which way? Which way? I don't know, but it's behind me here. Let's go, let's go. Oh. Okay, let's that go. was not the log you were moving. <laughs> it was behind me here. Let's go. Okay. I have all of a sudden lost my... Let's go. Let's go. Let me see if I can find you. Just stand right still and... I am. Was that it? No, oh, that's him! That's him! Because he moved. He's right behind me. I'm on a log here. No, he is behind us. Okay. He's underneath. Okay. Yeah, he's down in the mud. Let me, let me try to help him. Yes. Please hook him. <laughs> oh. Oh. You got him. Okay, the turtle is here. Okay, let me step back here. No, go ahead, do what? What did he bite you? You got him? Oh! Oh, I don't... This is beginning to... I don't know if that's him or what. I... Oh. You have one under your foot? Oh. This is more exciting than... Than I thought it was going to be. Look at my wife over there. Oh. Yeah, so you have one yeah, under your foot. I'm standing on it. I'm going to try to find out. A good one. Fine. Yeah, he's got to get down the log, too. What, what are you feeling? You got his tail. You got his tail. <coughs> I say, we got his tail. <coughs> Oh, man. Oh. oh, he was down in the mud. Oh, he was. Oh, look at that. Oh, Scott. Here. Here. No. <laughs> Congratulations. Oh. oh, boy. Oh, sucker kept trying to bite me. Yeah. Watch, watch the hooks on me. Yeah, I am. Oh, look at that. Yeah, he snapped at the stick. Yes, yes. sir. Oh, he's not going to want to let go of this. Well, let's uh, take him back in. A job well yeah. done, Sky. Oh, I don't know if I have the heart for it. Did you mark that big one? <laughs> Great, it's still wow. on. <laughs> this is something else. Oh, man. Yeah, I'll tell you, hold him up there for John to show him. Kids, I want to remind you this is not something you want to try at home. Scott Ponce has a way with snapping turtles. Hopefully, they'll never have their way with him. Well, snapping turtles may not be attractive, they may not be pleasant to be around, but they are tasty. Whether you fry them, or as Kathy Beitler shows us, they're delicious in soup. This is a winner in our cooking contest. Oh, turtle soup, always a winner with me. Oh, and Craig, Craig Senda, of course, from the marsh to the table. That, isn't that a strange looking piece of meat? It it's, is. It doesn't look like our venison pieces or fish pieces or anything. Well, the only thing you can say about turtle is it looks a lot better that way than it does on the hook. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm just going to go ahead and boil the pieces of turtle and you do want to add just a little bit of oil to the hmm. water. 
and it, you have to skim it constantly because the fat and the oils will come to the top hmm. and so you're, all through you're, the cooking. So what you're trying to do is tenderize the turtle Absolutely. meat. Absolutely. Yep. And then once it's done, you're just going to go ahead and make your basic soup recipe. You got potatoes and celery mm -hmm. and onions. All, and all the normal things you put right, together in a right. in a chowder or all a soup. goes back in the same pot, which really makes it nice. Turtle soups traditionally, as I recall, aren't simple soups. I mean, uh, you know, they're not that difficult to make, but they have a lot of ingredients. Yes, they mushrooms do. Mushrooms yep. and a lot of fresh ingredients. Celery. Yep. Tomatoes. And perfect this time of year when everything is coming out of the garden mm -hmm. too. And so, then for the base, we're just going to use tomato soup. And a little bit of uh, tomato paste for thickening. Mm -hmm. Oh, I like that. Those those are favorite ingredients with me anyway. <laughs> I love that tomatoey flavor. And the only spices Ooh. we got is crushed red pepper and a couple of bay leaves that you will take out later. Great choice. Oh, absolutely. And the bay leaves? Bay leaves, yep. Then I, you do want to take those out. It's amazing out. that you could taste much of this. You There's know, you know what that looks like? That looks like a, a, a beef barbecue. Right. It looks like. Yep, but it tastes a lot different. Has a flavor all of its own. And then it just goes all, just let that all boil all the way through. Hmm. And cook that, steep that. And you know, the funny thing, I, I, when we tasted this recipe, Bob Garner didn't say a word. <laughs> the, did, did the slurping sound, I mean, give you any indication of what I was doing over here? <laughs> well, I've been, when I'm being quiet, that's because I like it. I oh, just want you to know is... that you taught me well. I've got a clean mm. bowl club here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, no kidding. I'm on my yes. second bowl. She's in I'm my, on my act right bowl. now. <laughs> mm -hmm. It is so good. Mm. I gotta admit, the turtle. I can't really taste. You know the different, like the different parts of the turtle. Like some the, taste like chicken. Some taste like beef. Different, yeah, colors. Mm -hmm. No, you can't taste them. Well, this isn't a recipe really that features the turtle. I mean, turtle soup is oh, is man. always good. Everybody will eat it. It is so but this, tender. This this is. This is just mm. a good good type soup recipe, like gazpacho, like mm -hmm. we were talking about earlier. But it doesn't taste like beef. You know, no, it's, like it's it. got its own flavor. Mm -hmm. No, it's it is excellent, and it's like gazpacho soup heated mm -hmm. up. I love well, it. We got to we got to tell people they don't have to necessarily get like a snapping it. turtle though to use this recipe because beef or venison anything will oh, work well on turtle. Turtle's mm -hmm. the best. I Absolutely like, delicious. I like this more than Garner does. <laughs> Well, me too. I like it a lot more than you. Do. Oh no, you don't. Oh yes, I do. Oh, no, you don't. Yes, I do. No, you don't. <laughs> oh, okay, I get the last two more right here. <laughs> If you don't have turtle meat in the freezer, use turkey or pork or chicken. It'll work fine. The complete recipe, of course, is in our current issue of the Outdoor Digest magazine address coming up at the end of the show. Now, what about the current conditions outdoors? It's crummy, sloppy, unseasonably warm. I don't know what to say about it. If it doesn't rain this weekend, try to get outdoors. It's usually a great place to be. See you next week. You can go for it. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Here you go. Next week on Michigan Outdoors, it's our fish and wild game cook-off. Ten of the best fish and game recipes we could find compete for the judges' favor. Bob Garner, Charlie Keenan, and Kathy Beitler, along with three professional chefs, judge these dishes at 8 p.m. 90 minutes of Michigan Outdoors, that's next week, right here on Public TV. <laughs> I don't mind mine. You'll ruffle yours up. You rough yours up, I'll ruffle Where are you going with this here, John?